Hi everyone, this is Margaret Manning with lifeafterdeath.com. Lifeafterdeath.com is a community of people who are interested in the topics of the afterlife, reincarnation, near-death experience, and spirituality that surrounds all of that. We have conversations here on all kinds of topics and bring in experts who can help us to enhance the conversation on particular themes. And my guest today is Dr. Raymond Moody. Dr. Moody is a philosopher, a psychiatrist, and an author. He has written 14 books, and he's best known for his uh, work to, to, to do with near-death experience, which was, in fact, a term that he coined in his book, Life After Life. That was back in 1975. So he is now working on all kinds of research related to this theme, and I'm so happy to have you here with us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Moody. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Well, it's my pleasure. And actually, I'm so happy because we have a lot of people in our community who are familiar with your work. They read your book, and I, as I did years ago. And, you know, it's, it's just wonderful to have your expertise and your life experience. Because we chatted earlier about, you know, the near-death experience and what people report they see and feel and think. And you um, probably get all kinds of comments, you know, in, in response to that, like, well, for example, well, no, when people hear, um, you know, the brain is, uh, sorry, the uh, tunnel that they're going through, that's just the brain having chemical reaction as it prepares to, to die. And I would love to know how you answer that. I mean, what are some of these, how do you handle that objection? Well, the bigger framework I handle it in is that this thr this material is very threatening to many people, especially, mm -hmm. I think, people who are fearful of death or who have some sort of religious mm -hmm. ideology that it might conflict with. But um, the, the larger uh, problem is that the framework that we use for discussing this phenomenon is... Um, is incoherent and that it, it really goes back to Plato and Democritus. Democritus was a Greek philosopher who came around a little before uh, Plato, but um, Democritus was the person who figured out that contrary to the common sense idea that the table in front of you is an unbroken continuum or a side, <laughs> yeah. that it actually has to is made up of tiny bits that are too small to be seen, which yes. he called atoms. And whereas Plato took these stories of people who had been revived after apparent death um, to be indicators of an afterlife, Democritus um, said, no, there's no such thing as a moment of death, he said. And these near-death experiences are explained, he said, by... Um, residual biological activity in the body. Yeah. And that, that framework of discussion has persisted now for 2,300 years. However, um, in reality, it, it's not an applicable framework because uh, the identical experience that we call near-death experience, which occurs to people who are revived after apparent death, also occurs quite commonly to people at the bedside of someone else who dies. And as the person in the bed dies, the bystanders say that they, for example, see something leave the body of the dying person. I hear that often from physicians um, and or from relatives and friends from there. Or people Gosh. say that um, as their loved one dies, that they themselves leave their own bodies and they go up part way toward this light with their dying loved one, and then they come back and rejoin their body. Or people say that um, the room where somebody's dying fills with this beautiful light, or that they see apparitions of the friends and relatives of the dying person who have already deceased come into the room. And most remarkably, I have quite a number of cases of people who... Um, empathically co-lived the dying life review of the person who was Gosh. passing away, incidentally including in one physician who had was called to the emergency room to resuscitate a dying patient. But as the patient was dying, he said he was flooded with these images that obviously were related to this man's life, even though he, he had never laid eyes on the patient before. So something yeah. else is going on because obviously the 
the bystanders are not ill or injured, so there's no question of an oxygen deprivation to their brain, and yet they have the identical experience. Okay, I have never heard that before. Is this documented in any of your books that people could read if they were interested? Well, I, it's a long story, but I finally did publish one a few years ago called um, uh, Glimpses of Eternity. But this is something I came, became aware of in medical school right. because by the time I went to medical school in 1972, I'd been doing this research for quite a while and my professors knew about it and uh, received this very, I hear all the time, oh, poor Dr. Moody was persecuted <laughs> by the medical. It never happened. Okay. My professors were very, very helpful to me in this. Some of them who had had experiences themselves, others who had heard it from their own patients. So they were happy to see it investigated. And my first year in medical school, one of my own psychiatry professors, um, a very wonderful woman, uh, came up to me and she told me about her uh, experience she had when she was trying unsuccessfully to resuscitate her mother. And that as her mother was dying, she herself, the physician, got out of her body and saw the scene from above and saw the dead relatives of her mother coming to greet her and so on. So obviously something else is going on than oxygen deprivation to the brain. (laughs) Okay, so I must say, though, you were a bit of a rebel. I mean, this is way, way back there. You were in the same uh, sort of category as Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, mm-hmm. who we both have worked with in, in one way. Well, you knew her much better than I, but she was the same. I mean, she was, wasn't laughed at or ridiculed, but people were very nervous about what she was revealing about the, the, yeah. the experience of a dying patient. Yeah. You know, something is interesting, um, Margaret, you said I'm a rebel, and I think in the funniest way, I am the opposite of a rebel. (laughs) Because I really do accept the reality of reason and logic. I was a professor of logic. And uh, there are uh, rigorously rational ways to investigate this um, this kind of experience, but the trouble in in this world that we're in now is scientism. It's like what people just can't hear the the difference between rational and scientific. Yeah. They think it's the same thing. Science is a subset of the larger category of reason, and even though in 2019, the question of life after death is not yet a scientific question, and frankly, anybody who thinks that, that it is, is just, they're fooling themselves. Yes, yes. But it's still a very important question, which can be addressed ra- rationally. It's just that it's scientific method is not the correct rational means in <laughs> <and laughs> investigating. Well, well, I would call Plato a bit of a rebel too. So I think you're in, in good company. Yeah. So I think you're okay. No, actually, I, I was very moved by that because I, I was just going to share with you that I had a very similar experience when my mom died when I was only 20. And when I went to the hospital, I was too late. She had died um, completely. And when I got into her room, the room was just filled with um, like energy and little sparkly um, like almost yeah, those little sparkles. I, I yeah. hear about those all the time. It those was crazy. Not, what are they? Like? Well, so, but then I said to myself, this is my rational mind. I said to myself, I'm just going to faint. And that's what my body is doing to prepare to faint. I didn't faint. Mm-hmm. But it's amazing how you were saying that people who are the most sensitive and fearful are often the ones that come up with these kinds of you know, excuses like I'm going to faint. That's why I saw this energy from my mother. I didn't, I couldn't deal with the fact she was maybe still there in some way. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's kind of spooky. But what else do people say? I mean, they say that, okay, consciousness can't exist. Well, basically you've gone to this other place, you've experienced all these things, but it wasn't really consciousness of death. It was just your memories of what you know your brain was still ticking away so what what about memories i mean how does that people how do people you know how do you respond to that question like they were just you know remembering their life but they weren't really experiencing those things you described like you do you remember stuff you just you know you reflect that is um 
You know, one of the things I liked to teach when I was a philosophy professor was epistemology. And um, anybody thinks who thinks that they understand what memory is is really not very well uh, informed. <laughs> because that is, my wife is, um, she's very brilliant, and but she's totally non-intellectual. And she's never had any interest in philosophy or anything. But just to... A few weeks ago, she was saying, you know, memory is so weird. And it really <laughs> is. It really is. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's people are interested in paranormal phenomena. Well, what could be more paranormal than the phenomenon of memory? Yeah. And it's a great, I mean, it's the, the great philosophers had a great, lot to say about the nature of memory and in reality. We, we still, we don't even understand really what the nature of our personal identity is. Um, Descartes seemed to be absolutely sure, you know, that it's the mind and I, I think, can, yeah. I'm aware now of my consciousness, so it must be, but then a few years later, Thomas Hobbes came along and said, well, I agree that there's the ideas there, but there's, I can't find any mind underlying. Mm -hmm. And same, Hume said even more dramatically that, uh, said, whenever I go into what I most intimately call myself, he said, I don't find any substrate, anything. It's all I find is the impressions of the moment. Yes. And so what is personal identity? All of these are really big questions. And that's one of the difficulties of investigating this question of life after death is that people want to hear the stories, which we all do, but yes. when it gets down to the very difficult concepts that we need to think about this, people are just sort of back off. Yeah. Well, it's very natural. I mean, we've got this sort of reptilian brain that's, that's just teaching us to sort of survive and we, and we don't want uh, gray. We want black and white. We want, you know, fight or flight. We don't. So it's understandable. But I guess that the, the biggest argument that we have is one you've just described is that it's not logical. The conversation about life after death defies logic. So, any, every so anytime someone says, is there life after death? What do you say? It does. A.J. Ayer said something like, he said, it makes sense, you know, in our language, we can talk about somebody surviving a complete loss of memory or surviving a complete change of personality. But he said to say that a man can survive the death of his body just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and, yet it, and, and yet it can make sense. So what we, we've Throughout history, we've been uh, we've had situations where um, uh, things that don't make sense in one era do make sense in another. Yeah. For example, go back in your mind now to the year 1915 and assume the identity of a very well-educated person of that era, and now listen to the following three sentences. Sentence number one, all four of Ethel's grandparents perished and were lost in a shipwreck long before her mother and father were born. Okay. In 1915, it's nonsense. Or um, listen to this one. Uh, two women got married to each other at City Hall yesterday. Yeah. 1915, unintelligible. Or listen to this one. Um, I watched a movie on my phone this morning. Right. All of these things are nonsensical a hundred years ago, but today they're very well understood. You can yeah, it's actually very sending a probe down to the shipwreck and getting the DNA and with the cloning, you know, we could all these things are now imaginable yeah. that weren't before. Well, what's really exciting about the work that you're doing, I think, and, and other people in this area is that, you know, technology is becoming so refined and so um, precise that maybe, I mean, when you look at Ray Kurzweil's work about the singularity and how we're going to be, you know, potentially, you know, becoming robotic, we'll be putting things in our body to be super intelligent. Mm -hmm that maybe that will lift our consciousness to the point where all these things are so unbelievable about life after death. Because you've got some evidence. I mean, you've got evidence about people's memories and experiences, but no one's gone all the way. Maybe our consciousness will, like you said. Or the way I would say it is that 
In 2019, the idea of evidence of life after death doesn't make any sense because it, if you can't put any sense to it, if the, if the notion of life after death is self-contradictory, mm -hmm. then it doesn't add anything to say evidence of it, right? What we need is some sort of new framework where we can define a notion of what evidence of life after de death might be. And I think that's perfectly possible. I do. It's, uh, it's just that it's going to take a different kind of thinking than the thinking that people put the thinking that draws people to the question of an afterlife is the narrative charm yeah. and the conceptual side of it is something not most people are interested in. So what is this different kind of thinking? Do you think, I mean, you're, are you oh, working on this? <laughs> um, I remember as an undergraduate philosophy major at the university of Virginia reading Hume's essay on immortality uh -huh. and being struck that that was obviously correct. What he said is by the, he said by the uh, mere light of reason, it seems difficult to prove the immortality of the soul. Um, by what arguments or analogies could we prove any state of existence which no one ever saw in which no way resembles any that ever was seen? Some new species of logic is required for that purpose and mm -hmm. some faculties of the mind that they may enable us to comprehend that logic. In the framework that Hume was writing in, that seems to be an impossibility. And he was a great ironist. He was just being ironical. It was his way of saying it's impossible. It's impossible, yeah. But he, yeah. Was the, he had the right criterion, but he was wrong, I think, in thinking that it's unfulfillable. And it's actually quite easy to do once you get out of the framework of literal language. The logic we use is predicated on literal language, but sentences like there is life after death are not literal. Yeah. So, so you need a new yeah. way of thinking about it. So what does it take? I mean, is it meditation? Is it... Um, oh, you no, know? it's going through a specific... Uh, basically, what happened historically was that Plato was the first person to distinguish between the literal and the figurative, okay? Mm -hmm. And in doing so, he was the person who defined the concept of falsehood. The notion of truth had been defined about 100 years before, but he came up with the true-false distinction mm -hmm. and the, the notion of literal language being the basis of rational inquiry. Uh, but Plato was also working on how to think about things that don't make sense, nonsense, in the sense of Lewis Carroll or Edward Lear, right, right, right. Yeah. And, which is now for us literary. But the reason it is for us is that Aristotle rejected Plato's attempt to make sense of, of nonsensical discourse and let it ride on the literal and uh, the literal. And so, but that is correctable. And that, in fact, nonsense, the average person thinks that if, if this is the level of ordinary meaningful language, the common sense view is that nonsense is down here, that it's something sub the other way. <laughs> That's right. It's actually the other yeah. way. Yeah. And nonsense is a more complicated mode of language than ordinary meaningful yeah. language. And so once you figure sorry. out that, yeah. that, the structure of that, then the question of life after death has a whole new, there's new ways of looking at it. But see, that is not the kind of thing that appeals to people. What they want to do is they want to hear the stories, which is fine, but it will never be you can't ever get satisfied in that frame of mind. Yeah, I think that this is the challenge, though. I think a lot of people are satisfied with that because it's it's enough. It's enough. Their, their mind really can only grasp that much, and that's okay. And when I mentioned meditation, I only mentioned that because there's people, you know, you're just trying to, to get out of the brain that, that, you know, sticks to those kind of predictable explanations and you're opening it maybe the artist maybe it's the you know the crazy people who are the ones that are going to break through this i wouldn't be surprised and uh you know it's um i think that um there are entirely new ways of looking at this now I, to to me the the cutting edge now in the rational investigation of the question of life after death is um uh 
how we begin to understand the communications of people who are on the verge of death. Yes. And my colleague, for example, Lisa Smart, has done this wonderful book called Words at the Threshold, where mm -hmm. she has actually investigated what people say as they are dying. There have all, been, all yeah. been lots of literary things on that, but they just, they just want a nice saying or whatever. But what mm -hmm. is it that, that dying really tell us? Uh, Lisa is now investigating this. Yes. And the, the way that um, uh, language changes in the, di in the last few days of life is, I think, it's very important. important. Well, I'm actually looking forward to talking to Lisa. We're going to set up a separate interview with her because I'm really fascinated by that. You know, I think we've gone um, all around this topic and of uh, you know, the, the objections that we have to the question. And I think it's the ineffability of it that where we started, it's like a full circle. But um, thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but, you know, I have I've known for a long time that eventually somebody who learned my logic of the unintelligible. So I've been teaching this as a philosophy professor beginning in about yeah, 1969. So I knew that eventually somebody who learned these principles would have a near-death experience and that it would enable them to see this in a new way. And now it's happened. This very eminent scientist and artist is an elderly man. Uh, several years ago had a, a uh, just a horrific infection, lost his leg. It's just whole horrible mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Uh, he had been to one of my seminars some years before, and specifically when he was in this other state of existence, uh, oh, realized he got was, it. Yeah, so it's it's been confirmed once, and it it will be confirmed because it happens to be the case. <laughs> well, the more people that are listening to you are are starting now to push the boundaries of how they explain ah, this, yeah. and more people like that will start to have those experiences. Did you write about this gentleman, or is it something that's more personal? Well, actually, I have. I, I wrote a, a chapter in a um, book on uh, a textbook of philosophy of religion a couple of years ago, and I, I talked about that case. And I have a new book coming out uh, with Llewellyn Press soon, which is called uh, Making Sense of Nonsense. And the the subtitle is like a, a bridge between science and spirituality or something. Okay, this is a good one. All right, when that comes out, will you come back on and tell us about it? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you so no, much. because that is it. I really, I'm looking forward to that. This is not a black and white topic. So let's uh, embrace that and uh, move on to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> My students from the 60s have said that it's just amazing that once you think this through, you can see that common sense is wrong about nonsense. That's the fact that nonsense itself yeah, yeah. has a very elaborate and rationally discernible structure. Look forward to talking about that. I'm really happy that we had a chance to chat, Dr. Moody. Thank you so, so much for being here. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our Life After Death YouTube channel and visit our website at lifeafterdeath.com. We are a community of people who are fascinated by the topic of life after death and subjects like near-death experience, the afterlife, reincarnation, and spirituality. Together we are exploring and discovering these topics together with curiosity and an open heart.